Well, we're going to cover a number of different things today, but uh, certainly uh, need to comment on um, Trump's first 100 days and uh, what's he done, uh, success, failure, net positive, net negative, uh, and, and so how to evaluate it, how do you even look at this and evaluate it. Now, I think most of you listening to the show for a while know my general negative view of Trump. I don't think that has changed, but uh, we'll talk about that. I also want to talk about the Pope. The Pope gave... Uh, an important, I guess, statement at um, at this uh, at his at the Pontiff's Academy of Social Sciences. Who knew there was such a thing that's going on uh, this weekend? And uh, make an important statement about morality, about economics, and about libertarians. He, he commented about libertarians, and and what, part of what's interesting is the only news outlet to report on this was. Um, was Breitbart. So that's kind of interesting. Maybe that'll connect our discussion of Trump to our discussion of the Pope um, through uh, Breitbart. Uh, and uh, and then I, I, I also want to talk about kind of the Catholic Libertarian's response, at least one response that I read uh, on Reason Magazine, to what the Pope said. And uh, I, found, I found it particularly interesting and uh, indicative of kind of some of the uh, concerns many of us objectivists have with libertarians. But before we get to all that, and, and we can talk about other things, uh, French elections, that was interesting. French elections are interesting. We'll, I'll comment a little bit about that if we have time. Take your calls. Of course, you can call in with any kind of questions three, or comments or suggestions or just yell at me. 347-324-3075. We don't have many people who call in and yell at me. That's a little surprising. 347 324 3075, uh, you can call in, and, um, you know, everything seems to be rolling. Sound seems to be good, I think. Um, Facebook Live is on, so some of you are watching this Facebook Live. You can find it on Facebook Live. So, um, all right, here we go. Um, you know, uh, I, I want to talk about the Pope a little later. I want to start out, actually, by saying something about last week's show. So last week's show, if you remember, was basically this question about uh, are we living in the worst of times? Are we living in the best of times? You know, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, how, how bad are things really today? And, and uh, how, how do uh, really, more importantly, I was hoping that what to get out of it is, is how to even evaluate it, how to look at it. And I want to correct an impression that I think a lot of people got out of that show, and, and justifiably, because I think I gave that impression. And that is the impression that I believe that we are living in the best of times, that this is fantastic, that, that, that today is the best time to be alive. And, you know, there's respects in which I believe that. Um, and that people, objectivists generally are too pessimistic, and, you know, we're not going to fall off a cliff, and things are not getting worse and all that. That is not what I intended to say last week, if I actually did say that. I'm not sure I did, but if I, if I... What I wanted to illustrate last week is that this question is hard. It's complicated. It's complex because there are a lot of moving factors. At the end of the day, culture, history is moved by ideas. If the ideas are rotten, and I think there is the dominant ideas in our culture, more so than ever before, are rotten, not, more so than ever before, not because the ideas have changed. The ideas are pretty much the same over the last 50 years. But they are more prevalent. They're just more embedded in the culture. They're more around us, particularly at the university level, among students, among professors. If the ideas are rotten, then we're heading towards disaster. There's no question about that. Whether we fall off a cliff or whether it's a slow, agonizing decline, whether uh, in the meantime we progress economically and then start declining or the economic progress all ends with the Great Depression, I don't know. And I don't think anybody knows. And I don't think we know exactly how the decline plays out. But we know with certainty, we know with certainty, that as long as the ideas in the culture are as bad as they are today, particularly in the, um, you know, in the realm of intellectuals, then we are heading towards decline. And part of that decline is already 
evident in the fact that we're not growing anywhere as fast as we should be growing given the technological advances. We've got in the fact that people are just, I think, generally pretty miserable and unhappy. And, uh, and you saw that in this election. There's just a lot of frustration and anger. And there's a lot of uh, fear. We live in a very, very fear-induced culture. So at the end of the day, if you think about a successful culture, it's not just materially good. It's spiritually good, which means it's happy culture. It's a, it's a, it's a culture with a positive sense of life. It's a culture with, with this idea that things are going to get better and life is good and isn't, isn't it all fun? Isn't it all exciting? And yeah, there are things that don't go well in life, but overall, overall, life is a positive, wonderful thing. And that's part of what's disappeared. And living in a world where people around you don't have that positive sense of life is not as much fun. So generally, spiritually, I think life today is, is less good for most of us. Again, I think if you're gay or if you're a woman, that might be different. But, but for most, for, 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 for white males, I guess, um, spiritual life today is not as good as it was probably 50 years ago, the, the sense of life of Americans, the, the environment in which you live uh, in terms of other human beings, the positiveness. So I, I didn't want to come out overly kind of Pollyannish last time. What I was trying to say is we've got to be realistic, and we've got to be realistic about what the threats are as well. So there are too many people who think we're all going to die because of the, of the Islamic threat, or um, you know, Sharia law is going to be imposed in the United States. Or, um, you know, uh, I don't know, the, 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 uh, the nihilists are going to take over, which I don't think is going to happen. I think it's going to happen that the, the authoritarians are going to take over. Um, or the Europe is, 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 is in, in next month is just gone. It just disappears and whatever. So, you know, yeah, we are all screwed, but it takes time. And in the meantime... You've got to recognize the good stuff that's going on, and there's good stuff going on from the expanding influence of good ideas, prim primarily Ayn Rand's ideas, to uh, increased economic success. We do live in the most prosperous, most materially successful period in human history, to the fact that certain minority groups uh, 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 you know, are being respected as individuals, the members of the minority groups are respected individuals for the first time maybe in human history, and that's a good thing. Um, but all of that in the end of the day is going to be fleeting if we don't change the fundamental ideas that are driving the culture, if we don't change, if we don't take over, if we don't dramatically influence the, the intellectual citadels from the universities to the think tanks to the writers to the New York Times to the alternative media, but the, the, the more intellectual alternative media, as long as they are dominantly anti-reason, anti-individualism, and therefore anti-capitalism, then it's going to be very, very hard to have a profound long-term impact on the culture and to change it. Right? And in that context, I think the presidency of Donald Trump is important and indicative and one of the the more in my view i know some of you are going to hate this more negative signs in the culture and, and more negative signs in terms of what the future holds and where we head into the future and uh the ability to recover uh, well and, and reverse course because i i think that donald trump is such a negative uh human being and such a negative phenomena as president that I think it's going to make it more difficult for us to be successful. So this is the, the, the more pessimistic Iran you're going to get today um, rather than the optimism of last week. But, but what I really want you to get out of this is, is that this is hard, that, and making these cultural predictions is impossible uh, and, and, uh, in terms of how it's going to, what the outcome is going to be and, and certainly short run what, how it's going to happen and how – the bad stuff or the good stuff is going to manifest itself, that there's so many moving pieces, there's so much going on, that it's almost impossible to tell what is going to happen in the short run. Right? So uh, what we need to really think about and analyze of the ideas and how they manifest in the culture and, and what we can do about it at the end of the day. And, and we need to fight, fight, fight. We need to present the world with better ideas. 
we, because, because there's no question in my mind that if we don't, Western civilization ends. There's no alternative to Ayn Rand in, in terms of saving Western civilization. There is nobody out there. There is nothing out there that can actually save Western civilization except for Ayn Rand's ideas. And uh, it's an ideological battle. So we're in decline. Exactly what that decline looks like is hard to tell. Let's take advantage of the fact, and this is, this is, I think, an important point. Let's take an advantage of the fact that we're living in the best of times materially in order to wage the most aggressive uh, battle, fights, war, spiritually, ideologically. Let's take advantage of the fact that we have unbelievable technological assets, the Internet, in order to wage this ideological battle. And, 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 you know, so that's what I'm calling on all of you guys to do. If we want a better outcome than uh, civilizational decline, which is where we're heading, then we have got to, got to, got to, got to, you know, fight. And, and fighting means using the tools of the web, using the technology, and using your wealth because you're rich. All of you are rich from an historical perspective, using your wealth by supporting the Ayn Rand Institute, for example, using your wealth in order to fight for a better world, using your wealth in order to pay others in a, in a, in a you know, efficient uh, kind of um, distribution of labor, distribution of effort, uh, fund others to be able to do the work uh, in, in, to fight the intellectual battle. So, that was a fundraising pitch uh, be because all of you don't realize how rich you really are given that you're living in the richest, most prosperous, um, most affluent period in all of human history. Even if you've got relatively little, you're still relatively rich. So um, help us fight the battle, right? Help us fight the battle by sharing by writing, by speaking, by standing up, by educating yourself, by studying, by learning. Take advantage of Ayn Rand Institute campus to, to study these ideas thoroughly and also support us financially, support the Ayn Rand Institute financially, support uh, my efforts financially so that we can wage this battle, we can wage this war uh, better equipped. So anyway, all right. So how do we, how do we evaluate a president's first hundred days. I mean, I think that's that's a real good question. And and granted, the first hundred days are, are somewhat of a random estimate, right? It's it's uh, three months plus a little bit. Um, you can't get that much done in three months. Uh, it's rare that a president gets a lot done. There are only you know most presidents get a lot done in the first hundred days. Uh, usually, presidents who are coming out of a crisis, like FDR with the Great Depression. Well, not coming out of a crisis, but, but in a crisis, so that they have an excuse to act quickly. Um, or uh, are, are fantastically astute politically, like um, LBJ. LBJ got a lot done in the first hundred After his, his election, he was leveraging off of uh, a good economy, but also off of the death of, of, um, of a beloved president, unjustifiably beloved, but beloved. Okay, right, John F. Kennedy. So very few presidents actually get a lot done, but what presidents do, what their agenda is going to be for the next presidency and set some principles to guide that agenda into the foreseeable future, into uh, towards
and now it looks like it's so give you some principles for what I'm going to do in the next hundred days or to give people in in the case of presidents who don't really have principles to give people a sense of what the the next the rest of the presidency is going to look like what am I going to fight for in the in the first hundred days and I I um I did a show that you can find on, on the podcasting app and you find a blog talk radio uh, a, f- a few months ago about what I believe, you know, my first hundred days would look like, what I would do in the first hundred days. And it, it, it was a series of principles that would guide, right, my, whether I could get them passed in the first hundred days, probably not, but I would propose, I would, I would go into the first hundred days with specific proposals on how to achieve certain things based on very specific principles. So, for example, one of the principles was uh, that I would go into, if I were president, now there's a, there's a fantasy for you all, um, I would go into, one of the first things I would do is go into the first 100 days with the idea of um, reducing the scope of government. Reduce the scope of government. Not just the size of government. But much more importantly, the scope of government. So try to shrink government. And, and I, I would propose, for example, a, a massive bill called Encronism, the bill to Encronism, which would involve, uh, it, you know, ending all subsidies to business. It would involve um, uh, reducing regulations dramatically. It would involve simplifying the corporate tax rate. And I will get to, to Donald Trump's tax proposal later on, simplify, uh, eliminating corporate taxes or at least simplifying it so that there are no exclusions, no deductions, no, no ways to game the system in, in a sense of no, no reason for companies to lobby because they're not getting The principle is reducing the scope of government. And, and, uh, redu- and particularly when it comes to business, be- because I think that would be something doable, in, a, in, in, in the first 100 days, you, you could actually present it. You could put something together. It wouldn't pass and certainly wouldn't pass this kind of Congress. But at least you would put something out there for people to calibrate against. Okay, this is what this guy wants to do. He wants to shrink what government does, right? So that would be a, a domestic policy. And it would be all-encompassing because that would affect taxes. It would affect regulations. It would affect certainly affect subsidies and the relationship between government and business. It would affect all of those things, right? All of those things would be impacted uh, by something like this. It would give a real comprehensive plan and vision for what you for what I wanted to do. Okay, you know, and there would be other things like. I wouldn't even nominate a, um, a head for the Department of Education because, because by nominating a, 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 you know, a, somebody to head the Department of Education, you're basically institutionalizing it. I would basically you know, put a bill in front of Congress very quickly to eliminate the Department of Education. So I would list the departments I want to eliminate, and I would put them in front of Congress and, eliminate, you know, and start the process of eliminating them and have temporary heads, uh, bureaucrats heading the agencies in the meantime, and then start the unwinding process through legislation because you have to go through legislation in order to do that. But in order to show how unimportant these agencies were to me, I wouldn't even appoint uh, anybody of substance to head them up. So, so if you if you want to eliminate the Department of Energy, you don't appoint somebody famous and well known and of substance to the head, particularly somebody with political ambitions, to head it up. Right? You 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 you, you basically. Let somebody temporarily run it, and and you indicate clearly that this is going to go away over time. So, principle, I want to reduce the scope of the federal government dramatically, right, and primarily in the realm of business. As I've said before, I think the whole issue of of uh, entitlements and um, and of welfare is something that I would do second. I would first eliminate what's called right, corporate welfare, the whole idea of subsidies, the whole idea of special favors, the whole idea of that, while at the same time eliminating regulations. So I would free up the business world first 
and I would spur massive economic growth first. And then I would shift attention to eliminating the welfare state. And here I would, again, have an expansive view of welfare that is not just welfare qua food stamps, but welfare as Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and the whole thing. Now, in the context in which we live today, right, you know, you would have to, as, far as, as part of your early agenda, to have, right, to have uh, a, a, you know, repeal of Obamacare. That, that would have to be number one and, you know, one of the primary things. And, but you would say this is step one of a much larger agenda that is coming in the next four years, which is the repeal, the, the, the elimination or the phasing out. I like phasing out much better of the welfare state. So think of, of point one is the phasing out of the regulatory state, the administrative state, and point two is the phasing out of the welfare state, right? So these are principles. And then third, in foreign policy. So let me give you this quickly. I'm just going to do it quickly because I don't want this discussion to get into the whole issue of foreign policy, but also because I, I don't want the whole show to be about Iran's or my first 100 days, but we, I promised to talk about Trump's 100 days. But I want to give you a contrast. I want to give you a contrast because, you know, contrast to an ideal, granted, it, it, you know, and, and, and I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, bad, he's better than Hillary Clinton. Uh, you, you know, okay, I just want to make the case that he's not as good as Iran is, as my presidency would be. But I, but I want to show you principles are, right? So I, I would declare unequivocally an America first foreign policy, right? As kind of Trump has uh, hinted at, right? I would declare an America first foreign policy. That is, that the only guide to our foreign policy from this day on would be the interests, the individual rights of Americans, the interests of America, and the only interest of America is the preservation, America as a political entity, is the, uh, is the preservation of the individual rights of Americans. We would not tolerate a threat, any kind of threat, and certainly no violence towards the, 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 the lives or property of individual Americans. That's it. Then I would declare that I was withdrawing. Over the next, I would give it time, over the next two to four years, the withdrawal of America from the United Nations, from NATO, um, and, and, uh, and from, uh, from places like South Korea. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the unwinding of those treaties, the unwindings of those agreements, you have to give people plenty of time in order to do that. And I would, I would take it seriously, right, seriously do that. I would also start bringing back troops from about 145 of the 150 countries we have troops in. Uh, I just noticed that we're in the deserts of Kenya fighting some tribal war on some tribal side, not even not even – Islamic terrorism, just, just some tribal thing uh, in Kenya. So, because there are, there is uh, Islamic terrorism in Kenya, which, you know, maybe you could understand fighting, but this isn't even that. Bring all those troops, start bringing those troops home in a systematic way. I would also let the Iranians know that I was withdrawing from the treaty uh, or, or the, 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 whatever it was that we signed with them, and that they were on notice that we were, comp we were going to evaluate uh, our military options for destroying their capabilities uh, for, ha for, for developing nuclear weapons, and that any of act of aggression by them or by any one of their proxies against Americans anywhere in the world would be deemed an act of war, which would I involve a massive, unequivocal retaliation. I would also let the Iranian opposition know that um, they would get unequivocal 100% support from the United States for overthrow the theocracy in their country. And if they wanted money, weapons, moral support, anything they wanted, they would get from us if they did the dirty work of overthrowing their own regime. I'd also put the Saudis on notice and da -da -da, you know, the rest of the stuff. And, of course, I would completely unshackle our military forces to destroy ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the rest of Islamic totalitarian organizations 
out there in the world um, and, and, and embolden our allies to do the same. That would be the first 100 days. A lot of it would be statements. A lot of it would be, you know, proposed legislation. Uh, I, I don't know if withdrawal from NATO and stuff probably would require legislation as well, uh, but, but proposed legislation. And granted, in this Congress, none of that would pass. None of it would pass. And, you know, I know that. But you would set a conceptual framework for what you meant by freedom, for what you meant by liberty, for what the, your presidency was fighting about. All right. So let's see what has Donald Trump done over the last 100 years in the context of setting some principles, setting some guidelines, uh, in order for us to, to, to understand, to understand what his next, what his presidency is going to look like uh, in the future. So what, what has he actually done? I made a list of all the stuff in different areas that he's done. And, you know, and I, I don't want this to be a list. You know, health care, he appointed Price to head HHS. That's a good thing because Price is generally a free market guy. But then Obamacare was a complete disaster trying to repeal it, and it still is, and they're still playing around with it. On immigration, he had a travel ban, two versions. The courts rep you know, repealed them. He still talks about a wall. Uh, you know, so they're arresting more people. So hundreds more people are being arrested, maybe thousands more people, uh, and not just criminals, all kinds of people uh, who are in violation of our immigration laws, and they're being deported. Uh, as a consequence of that, no question, fewer people are crossing the border and fewer people are traveling from the Middle East into the United States. So that, that's kind of immigration. On economic policy, um, you know, he's talked about an infrastructure plan, but we haven't got one. He's talked about a tax plan. We got one now. It's, it's, it's kind of good. It's not a bad tax plan. We'll talk about that. But he supports the import export bank and he doesn't support other things and it's kind of a mishmash he's said to reduce regulations more symbolic than real a lot of that is going to happen through the appointments he's made some of them are good uh, and so regulations are probably going to decline under trump administration but he hasn't really stated anything dramatic about regulation two for one the two for one is like a gimmicky thing but it, you know it's kind of indicated an interest in, in reducing regulation but generally you haven't seen any kind of big policy proposals in economic policy other than taxes trade he hasn't been as bad in a sense of he hasn't withdrawn yet from nafta or gone after chinese as much as you expect actually he's, he's he's kind of friendly towards the chinese these days um, after he met with a Chinese leader and actually turned out to be a nice guy and they're, they're buddies now. Um, he withdrew from TPP. Okay, I think, I think silly, but, but fine. Tariffs on, now he's, he's putting tariffs in Canada. Kind of every president does that. He's not any worse than others, but he is talking about withdrawing from NAFTA, completely renegotiating. Criminal justice, they're going after sanctuary cities. Uh, they're eliminating oversight of police departments. Uh, you know, Jeff Sessions is a big... I'll support the police no matter what they do kind of guy. On, on energy policy, you know, some good things, making coal mining easier, uh, proposed cuts to the EPA. We'll see if they actually pass. Global warming, uh, you know, kind of neither here nor there. In global warming, it's like um, we're going to withdraw from Paris, but then we're not going to withdraw from Paris. And maybe global isn't warming, and maybe, maybe it is. You know, some of his appointments are good on that. Some of them are bad on that. And, you know, unclear, no, no clear articulation of uh, his agenda with regard to global warming. He did, he did put Scott Pruitt to head the, the, the EPA. That's a good thing, but then, you know, it's not, it's not being clear. There hasn't been a definitive statement. There hasn't been anything really substantial. Uh, and then, of course, there's foreign policy. Uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, he's allowing uh, the military to, uh, to, to probably to kill more ISIS than previously, less concerned about... Uh, uh, you know, civilian casualties, but also no big fundamental change. That is, it's just a bombing a little bit bigger, bigger bombs and stuff, but no fundamental shift in terms of, in terms of, uh, uh, of you are fighting ISIS. Uh, he's talked about NATO, but, but it hasn't, but, but it really doesn't support doing anything about going out of NATO. He has said he wants more money from, from NATO uh, partners, uh, that they're, they're, they're free riders. Uh, on China, love, hate kind of thing. He, he said the awful things about the Chinese for, for a long, long time. He was going to declare them currency manipulators, and then he decided not to, and now the Chinese are his best friends, and they're going to really, really, really work hard to control the North Koreans, so they're 
that we're all buddies now. And of course, on Syria, he wasn't going to intervene, then he did intervene, but the intervention wasn't really significant. I don't know what it all means. North Korea, he's threatening the North Koreans, the South Koreans, on trade. So I guess in order to reduce the threat of uh, a nuclear option on the North Korean side, he is attacking the South Koreans on issues of trade. They have a bad trade deal, but the North Koreans, I don't know what his position is in North Korea overall. He's tough, but then he's weak, and then he's tough on Israel. He was going to move the embassy, but he hasn't. Uh, he was going to allow them to do uh, a settlement without U.S. getting approval, but then he wasn't. Uh, he, he's, he's turning out to be just a conventional Republican when it comes to Israel, better than Obama, much better than Obama, but not really a radical, not really a supporter. And, you know, uh, uh, you've got a bus visiting Trump on May 3rd, so um, I would have bus the head of the PA coming over, so there's nothing much there either. Um, and then finally, you've got a president who's attacked the media, uh, attacked, uh, you know, uh, distributed false news, lied to everybody, makes up stuff constantly. Um, and, uh, and, and doing stuff like that. So what do we make of that? that it's, it's a complete mishmash, in my view, complete mishmash. And that's exactly what Trump is. Trump is a complete pragmatist. He, he has no principles. So what is the principle of this presidency so far? Well, that there is no principles. That there is no principles. That, you know, you know, one of the big promises Trump made, big promises that Trump made, was that he was going to drain the swamp. And what do we mean by draining the swamp? Well, I, I thought what he meant is get corruption out of government, uh, you know, get 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 uh, reduced lobbying and reduce all this uh, pull politics and pressure politics and 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 try to rein all that in. Now, you know, I know that you cannot do that. You cannot do that unless you have real principles. I never expected him to drain the swamp, but it was a great line, and it was a, you know, get rid of the establishment types, really, you know, some radical proposals and get stuff done because he was a businessman, he wasn't a politician. And he was going to be efficient, and he was going to be productive, and he was going to get a lot done very, very quickly. And, and a lot of people, I think, supported Trump under the idea that there was this appeal of, of hey, we've got a businessman as, he, as, um, as president. Isn't this cool? And, and businessmen are more efficient, they're more productive, they're tougher, they, they, they're more direct, they, they get stuff done because they, they, they count on facts, they're more rational generally. And, and this would be great. Now, yeah, we know he doesn't share our principles. He's not exactly, he's, he's far from an objectivist. He's, he's not a free market guy. But at least we'll have this, this sense that there's a real business leader, efficacy, and, and behind everything that gets done in the White House. And won't that be cool? And won't that be exciting? And won't that increase the visibility of business in American life? And won't that increase the respect Americans have for business? da 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 da, -da. So what, what would we say in, in, in those respects characterizes the first 100 days of, of a Trump? I mean, I would say what characterizes them is unbelievable incompetence, uh, nothing really getting done, a leader, a leader who resorts to lying regularly in order to try to shape public opinion in his views, right? So he lies, he makes stuff up, right? Or he exaggerates, you know, there's some truth to something. Or he tends to say something completely arbitrary and then go find the evidence to it and then, and then claim he never said the original thing at all, but that he said something different. You know, he, he just, he, he makes stuff up. Um, he's the kind of CEO that after this first 100 days, I think most board of directors would question whether they made a good decision by appointing him because nothing has been achieved. N let me say that again. Nothing, zero, nada has been achieved. Now, you can point to a few little things. All right, his energy policy is not bad. So uh, we freed up some of the production of carbon fuels a little bit here and there. Nothing really dramatic because no bills are really passed Congress, but, but through executive orders, he's made it a little bit easier, a little bit easier to do some stuff. But 
really, that's pretty much it. Has he moved us toward making America great again? No. I mean, there's not, you know, again, there's also other little things. I, you know, somebody just mentioned in the chat, you know, the FCC is, is moving away from net neutrality. That, that's good. That's good. So they're going to be appointments that he made. And I don't think even he made, right? People in his administration make. So what happens is they sweep into Congress and they look for the intellectuals uh, or they look for people who can run these agencies. And the people who can run these agencies are often very good people. The people on the right who are pretty good. Yeah, but but that's that doesn't that helps us in the short run. It's not bad. And the next guy that comes in the FCC will impose net neutrality again. And you know, the question is long term: is it going to change anything of substance? And I can't think of a single thing that the president has done that's good in that sense. But more importantly, because Trump represents anti-conceptual he can't talk in really kind of coherent complete sentences uh, now when he's doing an extra experience he can't he's not a, a, a thinker he's not a communicator of other than of emotion right? even the two for one is two for one where he wants to reduce regulation it sounds good it's such a silly way to get about to go about doing it it's such a silly way unprincipled unguided way of doing it. Yeah, let's get rid of two regulations from the 1880s and adopt one regulation that changes all everybody's lives. I mean, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. It's not a numbers game. It's not about the number of regulations, although that can't have relevance. It's about the scope of the regulations, about what they actually do, the harm, the damage, the, what it is that they're regulating, how they're regulating. And there's no principle. Two for one is not a principle. It's a silliness. So what Trump is doing, has been doing for the last hundred years, is living up to everything we believed a Trump presidency would be like. It's um, a bunch of, you know, short-term little bursts of energy focused in different directions. He's not drained the swamp. He brought the swamp right into his administration with a number of his appointments. There's no radical shift in government in order to reduce its scope or to do anything, as far as I can tell. It's com there's complete inconsistency. America first. There's no America first here. I mean, what was, what was the Syria bombing 59 cruise missiles into a runway and destroying a few Syrian planes have anything to do with American first? What American interest? was served. What interest period of anybody's was served by doing that? Nothing. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, talking, uh, not a lot of action, any front in terms of foreign policy. I mean, he, he's not getting tough with NATO. He's not getting tough with the Koreans, not the North or the South. Again, there's a lot of talk, but, but no substance, nothing substantive or interesting. You know, in foreign policy, there's, he's done nothing. What has Trump done? I mean, I'm, I'm eager for some, somebody to actually say, yeah, they, they dropped the biggest bomb in history other than nuclear bomb on this Cape complex in, um, in Afghanistan that ISIS inhabits. Good for them. You know, the only question is why wasn't it done sooner and why was the only one bomb dropped? Why didn't they bomb drop like five of them and finish the whole thing instead of dropping a bomb and then special forces still having to go in there? Just, just flatten that mountain, turn that mountain into rubble, however many bombs it takes so that these guys, you know, are all dead. And, and anyway, I don't want to get into how to fight wars and, and the whole disaster that is Afghanistan now and the whole disaster that is in the Middle East now. All the consequence of George W. Bush's weakness reinforced by, by Obama. We thought this was going to be change. There's no change. Foreign policy is exactly the same as it was under George W. Bush. A little bit marginally better, maybe, than under Obama. No principles, nothing guiding it, going in all kinds of directions. You know. And then, of course, the constant threats about trade. 
but without the balls to actually do anything about it, right? Get out of NAFTA if you believe that. But the constant intimidation and threats and name-calling, now it's the Canadians. The Canadians are bad guys somehow. Because of, why? Because some pressure group got to Trump and said, hey, we are suffering because the Canadians have cheaper imports or have raised tariffs or some combination of the above on lumber. We need your help. Oh, I like you guys. You guys are kind of fun. Okay, I'll help you guys. I'm not going to help those other guys because I don't like them that much. But me, Trump, I like these guys. I like the milk guys, the milk guys, Wisconsin milk. That has to be a winner plus Wisconsin. Then I win Wisconsin. Yeah, I guess I won Wisconsin by a small margin. Maybe if I give them milk subsidies, I'll win more, bigger margin next time. All right. Who else wants subsidies? All right. Line up. Which state? You know, yeah, that one's too, 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 too uh, blue state. Uh, you know, it's too blue. No, no point in giving those guys subsidies. Wait, no principle, nothing, nothing. A complete loser. So now we get subsidies on milk and on wood. On wood. This is, this is Trump's trade strategy. So completely, I mean, he made such a big deal out of trade, then okay, a principle would be, I'm anti-trade, I'm going to do everything in my power as president, to make America self-sufficient. I, uh, uh, you know, in other words, I'm an advocate of, of mercantilism, but, but, but he doesn't even have to say that. So, you know, here's 30% trade barriers on China and on Japan and whatever. You know, come on, stand for something. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm anti-trade. I think trade's awful. I think trade's going to lower the standard of living of working-class Americans. So I am going to put, um, impose trade barriers on milk and wood from Canada. And then if you look at uh, his attack on South Korea recently, just yesterday, I think, attack on South Korea on, on uh, the too much free trade with South Korea. And they're, they're, they're subsidizing their own industries too much. I mean, what a bunch of ignorance about trade. And I've talked about this before, so I don't want to bore you with that. Anyway, he didn't, trade the sw tra he didn't drain the swamp. Um, he's kind of good on energy, maybe, for now. He's kind of good on the Internet, maybe, for now. Um, okay, we'll get to the tax plan in a minute. Um, what about this, no this, uh, this notion of, and, and I hear this a lot, right? And, and so I was in Miami doing a presentation, and, and I, got, I got really, you know, I got some people really pissed off at me because of this Trump thing. Isn't Trump a reflection of this amazing self-esteem? And isn't Trump, is, isn't a, at a consequence for the first time we got a president standing up there saying, America first and projecting this confidence and self-esteem in America and the importance of America. And yeah, he gets it wrong is America first is about trade and building a wall. But shouldn't, that, shouldn't we just ignore that and, and just focus on the fact that here's a guy with kind of an American sense of life? Now, I don't know how to answer that because I find that so contra so wrong, so not what I see when I see Trump at all. I see, uh, 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 well, I won't actually say what I see, but, uh, you know, I, I, an entertainer who's, uh, who's, who's going to say what he thinks will get him your love and your votes. What does he mean by America first? How does he hold that? He doesn't know what America is. To him, it's just a geographic space. And what does it mean to place it first? Well, he tells us, when he actually sees the images of children dying in Syria, then suddenly it's appropriate for us to intervene and not put America first because the children dying in altruism beats America. I mean, altruism is more important to him than America because it was America first until he saw the images, and then it wasn't. So what does that even mean when he says America first? It means nothing. And, and when people look at that, and let's say they buy into the pseudo self-esteem, because it really is pseudo, because somebody with that thin of skin does not have self-esteem. Getting angry at journalists, getting angry at the media, getting angry at his opponents, calling people ugly, uh, offending people, lashing out on people, you know, tweeting at 3 a.m. about supermodels, that is not self-esteem. That is pseudo self-esteem. But, but imagine that some people say, oh, yeah, there's a self-interested business leader with self-esteem, and then he does these stupid things. 
That can't help us. That can only hurt us. And is he running government like a businessman would run government? Well, I don't know what that is because I think businessmen and politicians are two very separate categories. And being a good businessman has nothing to do with being a good politician and being good at government. But is he running the government in a way that you would say, wow, I want that business to run my, my company? No, I mean, you would never hire this guy to run your business based on his first 100 days in government. It's a mess. You know how many positions? I mean, I, th I think he has more unfilled positions than any president at this point in modern history. I mean, nothing about this presidency is efficient or productive in, in the sense that you would expect of, of, a, of a businessman. Um, so America first means nothing. And therefore, when people hear America first from me in the future, when I'm running for president, I'm kidding, when, when, you know, when an somebody of substance runs for president, They're not going to take it seriously. He under so to the extent that he sometimes says, says that he sometimes says something good that we can relate to, like America First. He undercuts it by his actions and therefore destroys the concept for us. We have to come up with a new name. Make America great again. Really, what does it mean? Again, the whole notion of America here, both in America First and in America Great Again, is of an ethno-nationalistic state. Keep those brown people out. Now, he doesn't say that, and he never say that, and maybe he doesn't even think that in that way, but that's what he's doing. That's what animates, animates his actions. So America First and America Great Again is America qua nationalism, qua collectivism, qua everything we're against, qua everything we hate, qua everything... I hate, I, I, I shouldn't talk for you guys. So in my view, Trump is an unmitigated disaster in his first 100 days in spite of the relatively good tax plan he just put together, right? which won't pass anyway, so it's irrelevant. He is going to, he's basically gutted the Republican Party because what does the Republican Party do now? So he's emboldened the nationalist wing of the Republican Party, the nationalist collectivistic wing of the Republican Party that is obsessed with immigration and hates trade. That has now become a much stronger, much more emboldened, uh, much more aggressive wing of the Republican Party. I think he's emboldened the evangelicals who tend to be nationalists as well, because mysticism of whether it relates to God or whether it relates to America as a, as a, as a metaphysical entity, is, is the same type of mysticism. I think the real free market people within the Republican Party are running for the hills. And, and, and I, you know, what, what, are they get, what, what is that going to be? What, what's what's going to happen with that? Um, but he's done, he's done much worse to the presidency. He lies. He invents stuff. Right, this this thing about MS thirteen, right? The the responsible for murders, and and this is a horrible gang, a really scary gang, that that was created from, um, you know, I think it was El Salvadorian immigrants or, or Central American immigrants into the United States, really going back to the nineteen eighties when Ronald Reagan uh, brought them here during the time when the communists were trying to take over Central America and have turned into these violent, horrible gangs. <clears throat> and, you know, just, but, but Trump makes stuff up like this. This is like all Obama's fault somehow. It's just complete and utter nonsense. And turns facts into just games of, of, of uh, which political party you're in. And of course, now I'm not saying the left doesn't do this. Of course the left does this. But if everybody now is doing it, and doing it at the extreme that, Trump does, where he makes stuff up, lies about stuff.
think the future is bleak politically because there were disarray completely, you know, uh, a complete disarray after four years of Trump, maybe even after eight years of Trump, but certainly even after four years of Trump, which means that the left is going to be stronger, more emboldened, more nihilistic, and it's going to be able to portray the right as, as this, these crazy nationalists. And of course, the fact that Trump is an unprincipled, um, pragmatist, anti-conceptual, you know, a really concrete bound mentality. I, I really have a, you know, my opinion of Trump was low before he was elected. It's just getting lower every single day, if that's possible, right? Now, I know some of you think he's a savior. So if that's what the Republicans elect, what's the future of the Republican Party? Where does it go? And, and, and isn't this just going to embolden the worst elements on the so-called right, the most collectivistic elements on the so-called right, who maybe actually stand for principles, but principles that we would be horrified in, in Leonard Peikoff's terms, won't this embolden the M2s? To say, look, we tried the business and pragmatic approach. Here's some principles. And won't it embolden the nutty, crazy, completely nihilistic left? I see nothing positive coming from a Trump presidency. Really, nothing positive. He's not going to drain the swamp. He showed us that. He's brought the swamp right in. He's embraced the swamp. He's part of the swamp. His farm policy shows no indication of being any better than any of his predecessors. It's going to be as altruistic, as unprincipled, as shoot from the hip, maybe at the margins a little tougher. His economic policies, you know, he has no leadership capabilities, and we saw that with Obamacare. I mean, he should have come out swinging after the election about Obamacare forced his Republican colleagues to adopt something that really repealed Obamacare, pounded at them. I mean, he won the presidency. He has, particularly in the first 100 days, huge political capital. Put that political capital, go to Congress, go to the Senate, slap those senators and congressmen around, get a deal done. Find a couple of Democrats from red states, who, who, where they hate Obamacare and get them to support it. Fight, 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 fight for something you believe in. But he doesn't believe in anything, so he can't fight. I mean, I understand the politics of Obamacare. It's hard. There are these moderates in the Republican Party, and then there's the Senate where you need 60 votes. But show some energy around changing that. Right? We're talking about... Otherwise, don't become... Which is not a bad tax plan, right? I mean, let's, let's talk. So let me just finish that point, right? So the, to me, the failure of Obamacare the repeal of Obamacare, is em emblematic of everything wrong with Trump. He's, he, he, in a sense, he's lazy. He sat back. He didn't do anything. Then when it came to his desk and it didn't have enough votes, he made a few phone calls, didn't work. He gave up. He gave up. Right? The fact that he doesn't care about spending. He's actually said, I don't care about the budget deficit anymore. I'm going to have an infrastructure plan. And I'm going to pass this tax plan that's going to generate fewer revenues. He doesn't care about spending. Fine. Now, remember, this is a businessman who lives on debt. Companies go bankrupt. No big deal because that's the name of the game. He leverages up, can't make enough cash flow in order to pay back his debt. He falls for bankruptcy. You can't do that to a country. You shouldn't do that to a country. So he's not concerned about cutting expense, expenses, cutting government spending. Indeed, he wants to increase it with infrastructure. So... But again, Obamacare is unbelievably emblematic of lack of any principle and then lack of willingness to fight for anything, including promises, explicit promises he made. 
And then in the end of the day, Syria is incredibly indicative of the role of altruism in his administration and the fact that pictures of dying kids are going are gonna to be what determines um, you know, foreign policy in this administration. By the way, I, it, Peter Schwartz has an, a, an op-ed in the Huffington Post. I encourage you to look it up, uh, look it up and, and read it about the whole Syria thing. Um, all right. Let's quickly talk about uh, Trump's tax plan, and then I want to go to uh, to the Pope, the Pope and Breitbart. So tax plan really involves lowering corporate pro uh, taxes on profits from 35 to 15 percent. Now, we don't have a lot of detail about the kind of exclusions and all, all the stuff you can deduct from your taxes at that rate, but, but hopefully that involves something very simple. Now, we all know that corporate taxes, of all the taxes, corporate taxes should be zero. Um, okay, but that's not going to happen. So 15% good rate. I mean, that's about as good as you're going to get. So I'm all for that. It's a good start. Uh, lowers capital gain taxes from 23.8 to 20. That's kind of weird. Why not lower them to 15 as well? But okay, it's a lowering. I'm for lowering, period. And then taking five different individual tax categories to three, 10, 25, 35. Um, Increasing the individual uh, deduction, the standard deduction, he doubles it, which I guess is politically really good because it gets the middle class on his side. Uh, making the estate tax and the alternative minimum tax zero. Yeah, good luck having that passed, but that would be great, particularly in my case, the alternative minimum tax. I want that one gone. That's a disaster. But then also making it um, so that you can only exclude mortgages and charity. Now, I would get rid of both those exclusions because it's social engineering. It's trying to tell you that, yeah, uh, you know, uh, charity's good and other and investment is not, or that, um, uh, what do you, a mortgage is the right way to spend your money. You know, a house is a good asset. Other assets are not so good. Mortgage is a good debt. Other debt is not so good. All of that is BS. So uh, I would rather none of that existed, but simplifying is better than complexity. I'm all for that, right? Um, so I think in many respects, all of that is good. You know, it's not principled enough. It's not, it's not radical enough, uh, but it is good. And, and if it passed, it would definitely spur economic growth. It is a reduction of taxing capital, which is what, uh, which is what this does, is a good thing. Generally, taxing people less is a good thing. Taxing corporations less, even though corporate taxes are just sales taxes on the rest of us. Um, and employment taxes is good because it raises the standard of living of, of Americans through a reduction in prices and an, an increase in wages. Uh, so all of this is good for growth. All of this is a good thing. And it, it's not a bad move politically because it, it doubles the standard deduction. It does a lot of things that could get some people motivated around it. But the real question is not whether a president has proposed something that's good. And by the way, the, the best thing about it is it gets rid of the stupid, ridiculous proposal by Republicans to have this tax on imports uh, because they want revenue neutrality and, and therefore they want to raise taxes on imports in order to give these other tax uh, reductions. That, that is such a horrible idea. Um, so, yeah, so overall, I, you know, I would score this a B plus. It's, it's really not bad as a tax policy. But A, is it going to get passed as... Has Trump shown any sign that he's going to fight for this, right? No, I mean none of that, not, none of none of the above. So, you know, I don't know what it's worth because I, I just don't. I, yeah, it's a nice plan. All right, it, it's kind of a classical Republican plan. There's nothing Trumpy about this plan. There's nothing uniquely Trump about it, right? Um, by the way, another big failure of the first 100 days, I have to mention this, it's a failure of Congress. But remember, the House is Republican, the Senate is Republican, and the White House is Republican. And they cannot get a temporary spending bill passed by Congress. They had to pass a one-week extension. It's just mind-boggling. Where is the leadership? Where is Trump's leadership? I mean... There is no Republican Party now. It's just the Republican Party is basically broken up into a bunch of little, a little pressure groups, each one with their own agenda, and no leaders who could coalesce them around anything. 
So the Republican Party is basically useless and dissolved. I mean, it was never that useful to begin with, but now it's completely useless. They can't even get the simple budget proposal passed so that the government doesn't shut down. And how? Anyway, if you're hearing frustration in my voice, it's frustration, not only with Republicans and this president, but with anybody, and I know there are a lot of you out there, who thinks this guy's good and good stuff is happening. When, when, all right, we got a call. Let's see who's this. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hi, Iran. This is Andrew from New York. Hey, Andrew, how how's you? it going? Good. Um, I'm glad I'm calling you at your exasperated point because um, <laughs> it kind of fits into what I wanted to say. Um, you know, I think as we as we monitor and, and view these the political developments, it it opens up an opportunity for objectivists in the following way. I think what we're seeing is a coarsening of the discourse yep. in the culture. Yep. Um, I think on the fringes there is a lot of nastiness, cynicism. There's people like, you know, somebody I respect, Ben Shapiro, who comes to mind where I respect his arguments. Yep. And yet, if I, I follow him on Twitter, most of his tweets are anti-left. Yes. You know, they're just kind of in they're They're conveying disgust for the left. So you have this very, very toxic communication and discourse going on between people. And I'm afraid that for objectivists, you know, we have to distinguish between you know, intellectuals like yourselves who are doing this, and it takes a lot of skill and it takes a lot of knowledge about the political and the economic arguments and all that, and everyday objectivists like myself, yep. and not to try to confuse the two. You know, I was thinking, if I, you know, talk to a coworker of mine about minimum wage, if I started launching into, <laughs> you know, a, a, a rational argument about minimum wage, it would do nothing. But what would do more to actually further rationality in the culture is if I am embodying a person, if I really am the egoist that I claim that I am, yes. and I am benevolent, I, 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 am, I am conveying benevolence yes. to people, which I try to do. If I'm enjoying my work, if I'm passionate, yep. if I have interests outside of politics and economics, which really are more like painful these days to concentrate on than enjoyable. You know, if that's my life, uh, these kind of negative things, and that's what I'm conveying to other people, we are not selling objectivism then. I, no, I, I agree with you completely. I agree completely. The best way to promote objectivism is to live it, live it positively, live it successfully. And when you do get into discussion with your coworkers, don't start with minimum wage because it's, it's, it's a... You come out, you know, they, they just perceptually view you then as nasty and as negative and so on. And, and this is, don't be a conservative in the sense of just criticizing the left. The thing to talk about is the positive. The idea of living for your own happiness. The idea of your life belongs to you and what that implies. The idea that there is such a thing as an objective morality out there. Even if you can't completely define and explain it in great detail, but just the idea that there is, that you live by an objective reality. They, and, and they can see it, and they can see its success. So I think morality is our strong point, not economics. Because economics, nobody cares about economics at the end of the day. What they care about is morality. And it's also, morality is about individual human life. You have a lousy morality, you'll have a lousy life. You have a good morality, you have a chance at a good life. So I think most of your discussions out there as individuals should be focused and centered around the moral case for happiness, around the moral case for living a good life. And the best argument you can make for that is by living it, is, is by living a yes. great life. Yes, well, I, I, that's what I really want to highlight is that a lot of the change that can be done from regular people is through just other uh, just living it yep. and other people perceiving it. Yep. And then if they perceive it, if they perceive that you are an integrated person who is happy, who is happy and who is an egoist, yep. somebody who is clearly, you know, they're not happy because they're doing for other people. They're doing for themselves, and in doing for themselves – they feel benevolent towards other people. 
but yeah. one is the effect of the other. And if, if, if your neighbors and if your coworkers and if your family sees that you are doing that, they will first, you know, many of them, I'm not going to say all of them, they will mimic you. They will inquire with you about what you're doing. They will do all, you know, that's how you can serve as an example for, to make the, the culture more rational, to make it more virtuous. Absolutely. And, and that, I, I'm afraid that I'm taking the um, yeah. Leonard Peikoff course on <laughs> rationalism yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, on the Ayn Rand campus, Good. and I'm afraid that there is still, you know, th- it's a, it was a monster problem for me, and I'm still working my yep. way out of it, but yep. I think I'm, I'm, you know, I'm defeating it, Good. but I think that th- it's a bigger problem than even a lot of objectivists realize, that they are still floating in what the purpose of the philosophy is, which is not being didactic with other people. It's not even making philosophical arguments to other people it is for your own life yep. to feel happy to pursue your own happiness and to actually feel that happiness to not just do it say like well i can recite Out of a sense the of duty morality to the objectivism i know absolutely and i encourage everybody listening to go listen to this course it's on uh, uh, campus.einran.org and it's um it's called understanding objectivism and in the section you're talking about is a section of rationalism where which I think is a problem for almost every objectivist, and it certainly is a problem for those of us who read Ayn Rand when we're young and get all excited and enthusiastic. And the ideas, because Ayn Rand is a philosopher whose ideas are deep. They relate to one's own individual life and how to live it. But at age 18, when you read the book, you don't have the tools to fully understand that, to grasp it, to integrate it. So what you focus on is a few of the elements which you hold in a floating way, as you said, a floating, without real connection to reality. And then you go out as a crusader to convince the world. And that does you damage because it doesn't allow you to fully integrate those ideas and fully embrace the purpose of objectivism, which, to, which is to be the philosophy for life on this earth, to, 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 to maximize your flourishing on this earth, to be happy, to experience happiness. And, and, it's, and it also alienates other people because they see you as this crusading rationalist detached from reality who, who, who is angry all the time. And so many objectivists I know are angry. And I know I come across on the show sometimes as angry, but people know me and, and they know that I'm not fundamentally that way. It's just the topics make me angry. But I'm not an angry person. So you, you, you're absolutely right in, in that the focus for those of us who want to change the world has to be in our own lives on living them on maximizing them. And then when we do present ideas to the to other people, the primary should be the positive. And if you want to do it in economics, yeah. even in economics, talk about how wonderful freedom is and how much prosperity it has brought mankind. Talk about Silicon Valley. Talk about the decline of poverty around the world because of freedom. Rather than focusing on something uh, relatively small, with big significance, granted, like minimum wage, where you come across as angry, as anti-poor, and as, as technical economically, where, where they're not going to get it, they're not going to accept it from you until they get the bigger, more important concept. So I agree with you completely, Andrew. And I think it's a, it's a crucial yeah. point. And, and don't obsess about politics, because politics, at the end of the day, while they have an impact on your life, you have no, con- uh, you have no control over politics. You have no impact on politics. So it, yes, it, it, it's almost... I wonder if you'd agree with this, uh, yeah. Yaron. I wonder if you'd agree that if, if, if I say to somebody, what are you passionate about? And the only thing they can tell me is philosophy, economics, you know, politics. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little wary because yeah. I'm saying yeah. to myself, is this person actually pursuing interests in the world? What about art? What about music? Absolutely. What about sports? Absolutely. What about hobbies? Absolutely. What about By the work? way, the Celtics I mean, won last wanna, night, so I'm happy. I don't want to minimize work. Um, you know, <laughs> absolutely. And, and, and look, unless you're a professional intellectual, unless, look, some people, their career is philosophy, and then that's what they care about. And some people, their career is political analysis, and that's what they care about. But, but as, a, as, a, as an, you know, just an objectivist, philosophy is a tool. Politics is something you need to be aware of because it impacts your yeah. life. And you need, to, for example, I would caution people not to be adamant supporters of Trump because it'll hurt you long run. 
But that doesn't mean you have to obsess either negatively or positively about him. Just be aware of the dangers. Don't support things that will hurt you. And be aware of how you're projecting your own vision to other people because you could do the, the cause damage by being overly supportive of Donald Trump or overly supportive of any politician today. Ted Cruz, no matter, whoever it happens to be. You, you can't be overly supportive of any politician in the world we live in today. It makes you look really, really bad because they're all bad. Um, you, but you're right, you know, what about music? What about movies? What about, uh, you know, do you have a sculpture in your home or if you can't afford one, do you go to museums when you travel? Do you try to experience life? What's your sex life like? What's your love life like? What is, you know, all of that that's is- a huge one. What's that? Yeah, that's, that's a, a huge, huge one. One, one I'm, uh, you know, yeah. I haven't talked much about, but maybe one of these days. Um, you know, yeah, it's huge. What, do you have friends? Why do you have friends? Who are these friends? Do you, do you have friends because they're, they're just they're places for you to bitch and complain, or do you have friends because you really share values and you really enjoy being around them and yeah. you really have fun with them? All of these questions are crucial to being a human being and to, and to integrating the philosophy. And by the way, one of the best ways, I think, to integrate the philosophy is to be around other people who want to integrate the philosophy too. So, so find good objectivist friends who are also on this quest to be happy and, and enjoy movies with them and enjoy discussions with them. And yeah, talk about politics as well, but do it in the framework of trying to, everybody's trying to have, get a better grasp on these ideas so that, not to convince the other person, so that they can live a better life for themselves. And those are incredible friendships if you can find them. Those are, those are terrific ways I mean, the, the last thing to learn it. That yeah. And then have to move on to the wrong, Pope. If I, yeah, if I could, ahead. absolutely. In the yes. world is the essence of benevolence, I think. If you get grounded too much in all of these negative things in politics, which are true, and it's not about wiping them under the rug. It's about acknowledging them but not letting them rule your life and keeping the perspective that, you know, you're curious about the world because the world is awesome. All right. That's what we want, I think, to convey to, to the rest of, of the public. Absolutely. And you've Thanks, just Sharon. screwed Appreciate up my entire it. show. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, because – I can't talk about the Pope after that. It's too negative and too depressing. And, um, and you know, I'll talk about him in another show. I, I think the last point you made is, is really, really crucial. So let me talk about that, and we'll get to the Pope next time. Uh, this always happens, right? I always promise to talk about something, and then it gets, it gets uh, devolved. Because I, I think this is a really interesting and crucial point. And I, and I, find, I find it frustrating. You know, I just among objectivists generally, but among objectivist intellectuals as well. Um, I find that I have a difficulty figuring out which book to read, what area to investigate, what to do with my time because there's so much that's interesting. Life out there is really, really fun. It's really interesting. There's so many topics. I'd love to talk about, you know, and, and, and it, it, it's always not an issue of, oh, I don't have anything to talk about, although I complain about that as well sometimes, but it really is, there's so many interesting, cool things I could be doing, there's so many interesting, cool things I could be thinking about, there's so many interesting, cool things I could be talking about, how do I narrow it down, how do I figure out what I actually want to do, and, and that curiosity, that wanting to read another book, that wanting to you know, and, and wanting to understand the enemy. You know, people, people who, who are bad people, who have bad ideas, let's say, not bad people, bad ideas, um, are still worth reading because sometimes what they say is interesting. And to understand why they're wrong is interesting. Right? 99.999% of the population on the planet is wrong about the most important questions in life. Aren't you curious why? Don't you want to understand both psychologically and philosophically and every other respect why? And that means it's, you know, you got you to gotta delve into it and find it interesting. So, okay, so I will talk about the Pope. You, you've convinced me. Because I find this interesting, right? So, so I read the Breitbart story about the Pope uh, criticizing libertarians. And then I found it really, really hard to actually find 
the Pope's um, discussion because nobody actually reads the stuff. They just, they just, they want a news bite. But I find this Pope really interesting because this Pope is very philosophical. And now he's, he's very, he's very philosophical from a, from a, 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 a Catholic, altruistic, collectivistic, and Marxist perspective. He kind of integrates all those aspects into the Pope. So I, I find the Pope kind of, kind of interesting because he's the enemy, but he's not, you know, I don't find Trump interesting. I find Trump just frustrating. Ugh, I have to talk about Trump. I have to think about Trump. I have to look at Trump. I just find it fast. The Pope is evil, right? But his evil is interesting, right? So he talks the language of intellectuals. So it, it, it's almost like reading some leftist thing. So first, the, the, the part about libertarianism is only in the, kind of towards the end of the piece, and it's two paragraphs among many. And this is a message uh, to, uh, to participants in the plenary session of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. There's an Academy of Social Sciences meeting this, this weekend under the auspices of the Pope. And he is giving this, this talk, and, and uh, it's published. You can get it from um, the Office of the Holy See, um, and uh, they've, released, they've released this publication. And so it's cool, it's cool to just read it. Um, but at the end of the day, the whole address here is about the importance, the significance of two things in their relationship. Primarily, the primary thing is what he's calling fraternity. He talks about fraternity as the governing principle of economic order. What does he mean by fraternity? He means this idea of, of a brotherhood, of we're all brothers, and we must treat everybody as our brother. So this is deep altruism. This is deep collectivism. Right? Um, so he wants... He wants fraternity in economics. And he says it's not enough to have solidarity. And, by, so what he, and, he, and he says it's not enough to have forced redistribution. He says, yeah, you got to do that, but, but it's forced. And people feel like, well, you know, my taxes were taken and the, my, my money was redistributed or we have a minimum wage or whatever. So it's, so it's enough. So it's enough. And he says that's not enough. That's not real. That you're getting off too easy. What you need is to feel like every suffering human being on the planet is your brother. And you have to have the, 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 the moral responsibility for him like he was if he was your brother. Right? So this is all about social justice in the social justice warrior perspective from the left, social justice from the Catholic perspective. Uh, if you're Catholic, it's very philosophical. Um, you know, and I don't have time to go over the whole thing. He talks about, uh, he, he talks about the, the, the fact that we've got inequalities, uh, wars of dominance, climate change, economic inequalities that have forced migration and, and new slavery and all these things. So what we need is a new society, a society of fraternity. Um, you know, and, 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 uh, it's not about giving in order to have. It's not about giving out of a sense of duty. He says that's, that's, that's not good enough. Uh, and he says neither the liberal individualistic vision of the world in which everything or almost everything is an exchange nor the state-centric vision of society where the state forces you to redistribute are good. You have to want to live under communism. You have to embrace it. You have to view all these other human beings as your brothers and you have to embrace them and live with them and share with them not out of a sense of duty but out of a sense of love i mean this is real socialism this is real christianity um and that this is the only way human beings can really develop and this is the only conception of real freedom and he talks about freedom and what is freedom and it's not just freedom from coercion and he, he talks about work as, as, as freedom. He talks about the importance of work. And in that sense, I agreed with him. He says some stuff that's true. 
about the importance of work to one's spirit, to one's self-esteem. Self he doesn't use that term. But, so, but then he says then, then people have, in a sense, he says a right is too cheap. They have, they, they have to be able to do the work they love, they want, whether they're capable or not. He doesn't say that, but that's what's implication. They have to be able to do work that's spiritually fulfilling for them. If, they, if it's not, then you have to provide them with different work. Again, it's a brotherhood. We're all in this together. Hey, brother, what kind of work would make you fulfilled? Oh, we have too many of those. Doesn't matter. We'll add you to the core. We don't need that work. Oh, it doesn't matter. You get to do it because you're part of it. And in that context, in the, he talks about justice of labor, and he talks about in the context of this voluntary society, in the context of we are all a brother's keeper, in the context of we are one big brotherhood of humanity, that's the context in which he lashes out against libertarian individualism. And he says, we've got this invasion at the high levels of the culture and education, at universities and in schools, of libertarian individualism. Imagine the surprise of libertarians to discover that they have invaded our universities, and they are everywhere, and they are a real risk. Now, I'm just going to say this. I don't have time to really articulate, but it's not an accident that Breitbart is the only one who picked up on this and makes this a big deal, because this is Breitbart's position. He is reflecting Breitbart. He is reflecting Steve Bannon. If you read Steve Bannon's uh, talk from about a year, two years ago, I think it's also at the Vatican uh, around these kind of issues. He talks about the fact that Ayn Rand type individualism, free market capitalism is bad. And it's bad for the same reason the Pope is articulating here. You see, Steve Bannon is for capitalism of, based on the Judeo-Christian tradition, for, for a brotherhood of capitalism. I don't know what it would be. But, but this is Steve Bannon's agenda. It's, it's, it's not in conflict with the Pope that much. And, and again, this you have to understand in terms of the people in the background pushing this kind of stuff. So uh, he says, uh, you know, uh, uh, this libertarian individualism is horrible because it exalts the selfish ideal, right? That deceptively, deceptively proposes a beautiful life. This goes back to Andrew's comments, we should be living a beautiful life. That's, I like that term that the Pope has introduced, a beautiful life, not just a good life, not just a happy life, a beautiful life. I love that. That's great. Anyway, he condemns that. That's a, that's a, that's a, that, that's a selfish idea. Um, you know, and he says, uh, libertarians today preaches that to establish freedom and individual responsibility, it is necessary to resort to the idea of self-causation. What else is there but self-causation? So he's rejecting kind of us as a cause, the individual as a cause, free will. Because this indivi libertarian individualism, he says, denies the validity of the common good. Yes, it does. Because of the one, in the one hand, it supposes that the very idea of common implies constrictions of at least some individuals. It's exactly Ayn Rand's point, right? That the only way to establish a common is to deny the minority, which is the individual. And the other, that the notion of good deprives freedom of its essence. Now, that's very libertarian, but not objectivist. Right? So good, we uphold as an individualistic thing. Good is the good for the individual. But many libertarians who deny morality, who don't want to deal with morality, good indeed is, because they're complete subjectivists. Complete subjectivists. They view the good, i.e. morality, as indeed constraining their freedom. So that's actually pretty smart of the Pope. He's got something there in terms of his critique of broader libertarians, not, not objectivists, right? So he says, uh, you don't have a right to expand, expand your power, your wealth, whatever. And he quotes, even at the expense of the exclusion and marginalization of the most vulnerable majority. So first of all, he assumes that the vulnerable are the majority when they're not. But he also says, at the expense of the exclusion and marginalization, not at the expense of a zero-sum world where you're taking stuff from them, but the marginalization or exclusion, they don't participate in what you're doing. Again, very clever. But this is all kind of, you know, socialist, altruism, collectivism. 
And he says the essence of created freedom, the essence of created freedom, note the created freedom, is bonds of relations, family and interpersonal. Right? And, and he says libertarians want to reject all this. And excluded with the excluded and marginalized. That's that's what has, that's what freedom is about. With the common good and finally with God. So freedom comes around from the bonds or relations we have with family, with other people, with them, and particularly the marginalized, with the common good and with God. That's what freedom is for him. Now, wow, this this is pretty philosophical. Now, I know I've got two calls in. I'm going to take those calls if they're going to if you're really quick because otherwise I don't have time. But let me let me just pull up if I can find it. Where did I put it? I know it's here. Um, let me put up reason.com's criticism of the Pope, right? So first I say, look, this Pope doesn't understand economics. Pooh, we know he doesn't understand economics. He just shut up about economics. Stop talking about libertarians because you don't know economics. But nothing the Pope said had anything to do with economics. It had anything to do with economic knowledge. What the Pope is talking about is philosophy. He's talking about morality and politics. And morality is his domain. Morality is the domain in which he is supposed to be infallible, according to Catholics. So this article in Reason Magazine is dismissing him because eh, he's just, you know, he just doesn't understand economics and he doesn't get it. And then it goes on to say, well, but of course we libertarians care about the common good. Indeed, libertarianism is the way to achieve the common good. And then she writes, the Pope might, for instance, be taken aback to discover that many libertarians hold beliefs that transcend the, an Ayn Randian glorification of selfishness. Yeah, so throw Ayn Rand under the bus in order to save yourself and your Catholicism. Uh, and or... You know, that, that what we care about is interpersonal relations. We care deeply about the common good. This is what she writes, right? Um, we're, we're, oh, here she says. And, and, then he, and then she says, most of all, we would likely be startled to, he would likely be startled to find that. Far from thinking, quote, only the individual decides what is good and what is evil, unquote. Few libertarians are moral relativists parentheses, except for the objectivists, of course. Or am I getting that wrong? Close parentheses. So we are the moral relativists? Why? Because we don't believe in God? I did a show on that a little while ago. Right? So this is the libertarian defense against the Pope. He doesn't understand economics, but he's not talking about economics. Oh, when he talks about ethics, we agree with him. We just think the way to really live your ethics is with libertarian ideas, the right economics. I mean, how frustrating. And then, of course, they throw Ayn Rand under the bus and they completely misrepresent us and so on. So that's reason.com for you. Uh, it's called On the Invasion of Libertarianism, Pope Francis Ignorance is Showing by Stephanie Slade. Oh, my God. And she admits to being a Catholic and she's trying to, I guess, defend the Pope uh, against his own economic ignorance as if that is the problem. It, it's really nuts. So really nuts. All right, I'm going to take these calls because I hate leaving them behind here. All right, hi, you're in the Ron Book Show. Who's this? Good afternoon, Dr. Book. This is Skylar Saunders okay. from Delaware. Skylar, really quickly because I like have 60 seconds. Yes, sir. What is it behind Pope Francis's smile? He seems to smile a lot. What is it behind that smirk he gives? Well, it's a smoke. It's, it's a sense time. of superiority. It's a sense of, uh, I know you don't. And it's, a sudden, it's a, certainly a sense of elitism. You know, I care about the poor, but not really. I mean, you know, and he doesn't really care about the poor. If he, of course, if he cared about the poor, he'd be a capitalist. Um, what he cares about is Catholic doctrine. What he cares about is about certain aspects of Catholic doctrine that align with, um, with uh, Catholicism, the altruism and the collectivism, the altru the, this fraternity. That's what he cares about, the sacrifice of the individual for the group and the emphasis on, on the group. Thanks, Skyla. All right, it, it, somebody mentioned in the chat, it's like Ellsworth Tui's smile, and I think that's right. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Aloha, it's Stuart. Hey, Stuart. 20 seconds. So, so quickly, I want to ask you if you've seen Johan Norberg's documentary about New Zealand. 
and how it was a socialist party that miraculously faced reality, faced that they were on fiscal cliff. You can't switch hours, topics on me with 20 seconds left, Stuart. So you are going to have to come back to that in a future show, all right? But I have not seen well, the documentary. The whole- I have not seen the documentary, but I do know. Uh, but I do know about about the uh, the what happened in New Zealand and how it was the left that completely reformed New Zealand. And it's not New Zealand is not the only place where that's happened. Uh, but we'll talk about that in the future show. All right, uh, you've been listening uh, to the Ron Book Show. Uh, let me let me give you a, a TV show recommendation from Netflix. Um, and let me let me just see. Let me give you a. Um, and I can't remember if I've given you this recommendation or not. Um, yeah, there it is. Okay, so it's a show. Now you have to you have to you're gonna have to read uh, uh, subtitles. So hopefully you're willing to tolerate subtitles. But it's a show called Merli, M E R L I, and it's in not Spanish, not French, not Italian, but Catalan, the language spoken in Barcelona. And it's about a philosophy teacher at this high school, right? Now, every show's title is a name of a different philosopher. And it's, it's actually quite, you know, interesting. Now, he's a lefty, and it's got a lot of leftist BS in it. And, um, and his understanding of some of these philosophers is questionable. But it's fun, and it's interesting, and uh, and it's definitely worth watching. It's on Netflix, so if you've got Netflix, it's free. It's got season one has 13 episodes. There's already a season two, but Netflix isn't carrying it yet. It's called M-E-R-L-I. Every show is a different – and it's like – it's about teenagers. It's about um, high school kids and, and their teachers. So it's a little juvenile in that sense, and it deals with issues uh, surrounding uh, the teen years. But I, I found it very entertaining and interesting, and it's always kind of interesting, challenging to think about how is the particular philosopher that they chose for the particular show, how does that integrate throughout the show? How does their understanding of that philosopher integrate throughout the show? Um, so if you're willing not to be too critical of some of the distortions of the philosophies, and if you're willing to uh, accept the fact that once in a while they'll be quite lefty, and uh, you're willing to read subtitles, I encourage you to watch the show. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Have Enjoy the rest of your weekend. I've got one more show left today. It'll be streaming on Facebook Live and on iHeartRadio, and that'll be my final, last ever Iran Brooks show on AM560. That show is ending. It has been um, eliminated. So uh, tune into the last show, and I'll explain more. All right. Have a great weekend.